source of light. The source of light. The light of life. The light of life. Has come. Hey, good morning, church. Uh, a little bit of uh, unexpected housekeeping this morning, but uh, while we were sleeping last night, uh, there was a tornado in, in Benton County last night, just so our up north. And uh, we just want to take a second and just pray for Benton County. Is that okay? There was a tornado, and uh, I know some homes have been kind of uh, messed up, and some properties and businesses, and I even heard there was, uh, there was one death. And so we just want to pray and uh, support our neighbors up there and even our friends at, at Cross Church Pinnacle Hills and New Heights Bentonville and Fellowship Rogers and Key Point Bentonville. All those churches, they're not meeting today because there's power outages. And so we just want to take a second and just pray for our neighbors up north. So I believe this is north. And uh, let's just stick our hands out um, towards the north and uh, pray for them and cover them. Jesus, thank you that you're near to the brokenhearted that you care for us, um, that nothing is a surprise to you. But I do ask that your tangible love and care through both your presence and your people would be felt up north in the coming months, God, through restoration efforts and even families that have been um, just affected in uh, unbelievable ways, God. Um, I just ask that everything that the enemy would want to use this for, that you would turn on its head and somehow use for good. So God, be with our friends, be close to the brokenhearted, and please just bless our neighbors up north. Amen. 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 All right. All right. So what do Buddy the Elf, Jack Dawson, George Costanza, and Forrest Gump have in common? They are all just hopeless romantics. Okay? Okay. They're all hopeless romantics. You see, Jack Dawson snuck into the first class section of the Titanic, risked his life multiple times, and ultimately sacrificed himself for Rose. Forrest Gump finds himself chasing after Jenny with a lifelong dedication and persistence, despite it seldom being reciprocated. George Costanza, on separate occasions, found himself converting to Latvian Orthodox and pretending to be a marine biologist to impress a woman. And of course, Buddy the Elf trekked through the, the, the seven levels of the Candy Cane Forest and through the seas of the swirly, twirly gumdrops to find his dad and ultimately love of his life. So today, we're going to continue our series in John and talk about another hopeless romantic. Does that sound good? All right. So... My name's Noah Epstein, and I have the privilege of getting to serve our youth. That's our 6th to 12th graders here at New Heights Church. And I know that we have family camp going on, so there's, uh, there's no kismish today. So if, if, you know, if a baby cries or something, that's totally fine. That's totally fine, okay? And so I, I love having the kids in the room, and uh, I think we're going to have a blast today. So to kind of set the stage, here's where we're at in, the, in our series on John. So Jesus is kind of leaving his, his country bumpkin sideshow ministry. He's, you know, he's leaving Capernaum and Galilee, all these little small towns, and he's making his way to the big city. So he's leaving Elkins, he's leaving Lincoln, he's leaving Farmington, he's leaving Prairie Grove. He's going to Bentonville, baby. He's going to the big city, you know? And um, yeah, so it's, it's the week of Passover. And so just uh, hordes of people are coming to Jerusalem and he's joining them. But on his way to Jerusalem, he's spending uh, a day in Bethany, which was kind of another one of his ministry hubs. Um, it's kind of like a suburb, a couple miles outside of Jerusalem. And he's just eating dinner with his friends. He's eating dinner with Mary and Martha and his newly raised from the dead friend, Lazarus. And so they're just eating dinner together. And uh, spoiler alert, if you read ahead, uh, he's about to be crucified this week. So in about seven days, um, the greatest event in human history is about to take place. But before that, he's just taking some time, honestly, just to relax and having kind of a classic just Jewish feast with his friends. And so he's in Bethany with his friends eating dinner. So let's get in the text together um, in John 12. You can take your Bibles or your Bible devices and go to John 12, verses 1 through 11. We'll be there the whole time. That's the only passage we're looking at today. So, John 12. 
Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the whole house was filled with the fragrance of this perfume. So we see right off the bat, they're having this long kind of leisurely uh, classical Jewish feast. So they would have probably been sitting on the ground, maybe on some, uh, like a rug and some pillows. They're just reclining. They would probably would have sat here for hours as the different courses of the meal took place. And then out of nowhere, Mary just kind of sets the stage for New Testament worship. And she just pours out this alabaster jar of perfume. And for us, we don't think much of that. We think, okay, you know, a bottle of perfume, maybe that's a hundred, maybe that's $200 if it's really nice perfume. Um, but this, this wasn't the case. This, this was likely, this was her 401k. This was her retirement plan. You see, these, these bottles of perfume would have been passed down through generations because they were worth so much. This was kind of the escape route in life. This was, hey, if there's a famine or there's a drought or there's a bad harvest or something happens in the market and you can't make money that year, you, this is the backup plan. And she's pouring it out. She's pouring out. She's, she's, she's burning the ship. She's going past the, the, past the place of Rubicon, you know, the point of no return. And she's pouring all her love out onto Jesus. And, um, and it says this was about one year's wage. And so it was kind of a working man's wage. So we got to think of this in terms of this was maybe forty to $60,000 worth of perfume that she just pours out onto Jesus' feet. And this, uh, this was not a one-off moment for her. This was not just an emotional moment. She got caught up in it, you know. It was Passover week, emotions were high. It wasn't like a camp high. It wasn't a Jesus high. It wasn't a spiritual high. Because the three times that we see Mary of Bethany in scripture, she's at Jesus' feet. See, see the first time we see her at Jesus' feet, Lazarus was sick. Lazarus was sick. Um, I know, so that's the second time. The first time, I'm sorry, was when, um, uh, let's see here. The first time was when her sister Mary was serving. Her sister Mary is serving and she's sitting at Jesus' feet, right? And the second time, Lazarus is sick and she's distraught that Lazarus is ill. So she finds himself, herself at his feet again. And then the third time, the, only, the last time we, we really see her, she's at Jesus' feet again. So she had a lifestyle of surrender. This wasn't a one-off moment for her. This was her lifestyle, was being at Jesus' feet, being surrendered to him. And a quick biblical side note here. Um, this instance of Jesus getting his feet anointed and covered in perfume, this is separate from the instance in the book of Luke. So in Luke 7, we see another woman pour out oil on Jesus' feet, a similar uh, kind of bottle of perfume. And that took place in Galilee about a year uh, before Jesus' crucifixion. So now we're in Bethany and it's only a week before his crucifixion. So different city, different time, different woman, but same bottle, similar bottle of perfume. So back to our text. In verse four, so she pours out this bottle of perfume, kind of setting, setting the standard for New Testament worship. And it says, one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected and said, why wasn't this perfume sold and given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. And he didn't say this because he actually cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was a keeper of the money bag and he used to help himself to what was put into it. So Judas, one of the disciples, gets offended at this extravagant offering, right? Gets offended at just the, the purity of her worship. And you see, we know that, Jesus, that Judas didn't actually serve Jesus. He served money. He walked with Jesus, but he worshiped money. We know this. And, and so for him to see his idol, his God, just get poured out, seemingly wasted, on Jesus' feet was, was incredibly offensive to him. It was incredibly offensive. And I think in some ways you could say he was being a second commandment Christian while Mary was being a first commandment Christian. What do I mean by that? Well, we know in the book of Matthew that Jesus says, 
This is the first commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. So we love God first, and the second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And so Judas got the order of operations mixed up. He was like, we could have loved so many people with this. But Mary understood that it was about loving Jesus. That's the first commandment. And that's even why as a church, if we look, we have love God passionately and then love people tangibly. Because there's an order of operations in God's economy. There's an order of operations in the kingdom of heaven. Because what happens is when you get this mixed up, because it's obviously love people tangibly. That's the second thing, still really important. So Jesus was like, we could have loved the poor. We could have loved so many people with this. Is that important? Yeah. But what happens is when you live as a second commandment Christian, meaning you forget that it's all because of God, because we love Jesus. And when you do this for so long and, and, and you don't remember the first one, you, you forget that this even exists. And then all of a sudden you're just loving people and you don't even know why you're doing it. And as Christians, should we care about suffering in the world? Of course. But the kind of suffering we should care about most is eternal suffering, is eternal suffering. And I've watched as friends of mine throughout the years, they started off loving Jesus, but then they got caught up in good things, caring about suffering, justice, all these things. And then all of a sudden they forget about this. And all of a sudden it's just, well, I think I'm just gonna keep just caring about people. And I don't, I don't even really know why I'm doing it, but that's just, that's just, because it's, easy, it's much easier to be a second commandment Christian because you can quantify it. I'm sure Judas, as the keeper of the money bag, as the accountant, even though he was a shady accountant, I'm sure he was going, counting the money, counting that oil being poured out, going, we could help 200, 300 people with this, you know, or whatever. He, you could quantify it. You can't quantify loving Jesus. You can't say, I love, I'm in this level of right relationship with Jesus, you know? You can't quantify it. But in this moment, he missed it. This was a first commandment, but this was a just pour your heart out on Jesus moment. This was a first commandment Christian moment. So Jesus responds, verse seven. He says, leave her alone, Jesus replied. And it, it was intended that you should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. What's he saying? He's saying, Judas, you don't get it. I'm the gift to the poor. He's saying, yeah, we could have used oil. We could have bought them some meals. We could have provided some temporary housing, whatever. But ultimately, I care about their salvation. Ultimately, I care about their sanctification. I, my life being poured out on a cross in seven days. That's the gift to the poor, Judas. And so Jesus is going, you're missing it. You're missing it. And then it kind of goes on from this in verse nine. And it says, meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. So obviously there's no greater testimony than I was laying dead in a tomb. My body was decaying and now I'm alive and Jesus did it. So Lazarus is just this walking testimony and all these Jews are like, what's going on? So that's, that's, that's the entirety of our text today. So if you're taking notes, here's our first point, okay? Laid down lovers look foolish to the cold hearted. Laid down lovers look foolish to the cold hearted. You see, there's a time for practicality. There really is. But then there's a time for passion. Because as believers, we always compare scripture with scripture. So uh, the takeaway from this text is not just deposit your whole bank account and give it all away to the poor right now. Why? Because we know in the book of Proverbs, it says to save up. We know in the book of Proverbs, it says that the wise man invests for the winter. He sets money aside away for the famine, for the drought. So we got to compare scripture with scripture here. But Mary understood this was a time for passion. It wasn't a time for practicality. Judas missed it. 
You see, uh, when I got engaged to my wife a few years ago, that was a time for passion, not for practicality. You see, I could have gotten her this ring, this ring right here. I could have gotten her the Walmart three-star, $5.20 ring. It actually looks beautiful. It's 14 carats, baby. It's a lot of carats. It wasn't the time for that. Which, by the way, if you got that ring, good on you. You saved a lot of money compared to me. I'm a little jealous. Got a little Judas in me there. But here's the deal. My wife didn't even ask for a certain ring. I just found a ring and I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I was like, I have to get her this ring. I found it online and I was like, I am so in love with her. I have to make the irrational decision because this ring would have served the same purpose. We still would have been married and God would have blessed that union either way. But because I was so in love, I had a sacrificial offering ring, a valuable ring I wanted to get for her. And in the same way, Jesus, I don't think Jesus asked Mary. He wasn't like, all right, it's time. Pour out the 401k, pour out the oil on my feet now. No, Mary was just in love. And lovers do irrational things. Because, you know, just like Buddy the Elf, okay? Buddy the Elf doesn't want to get his girl a cup of coffee. What does he want to get her? The world's best cup of coffee, you know? And, and I didn't want to just get my wife the Walmart ring. I wanted to get the ring that cost me something, that was actually a sacrifice, that it, I felt the hit on my bank account, you know? And the first act of love is always the giving of attention. Does Jesus have your attention? You see, because even though Judas was physically with Jesus, he didn't have his attention. He didn't really care about what was going on there. All the while, Mary is just enthralled with Jesus. Just, just can't get enough of him. You know, and, and if, if th those of you in this room who are married, you know, you can probably think back to when you first caught the attention of your spouse. You know, it's like an 80s movie. There's like slow motion and there's like the 80s ballad playing in the background. And you first, you're like, oh, I like what I see. You know? Because the first act of love is always giving attention. And I want to make this clear as we talk about big sacrifices that God does not expect equal he doesn't expect equal gifts from all of us. It's not about the monetary amount or the time amount or the resource allotted, but he does expect equal sacrifices. He doesn't expect equal gifts, but he does expect equal sacrifice. There's this uh, A.W. Tozer quote, classic Christian author, and he says this, there are rare Christians whose very presence incites others to be better Christians. And I want to be that rare Christian. You can feel that, that tension in this moment, right? You can almost just feel Mary starts just pouring out the oil and Judas being like, oh, what, are you, what are you doing? You can almost feel just the jealousy, the anger, because it's like he doesn't understand that level of purity, that level of worship. And... I, I want to be honest, when I was given this text a few weeks ago, um, of course I was honored, but at the same time, I kept reading through the text and I found myself, honestly, as I'm getting older and maybe it's because I'm about to have a son and so I'm, you know, I want to be able to provide rightfully and all that, I found myself relating to Judas more in the text. You know, and kind of my inner Dave Ramsey was kind of coming out. That's a, that's a good, that, you know, that's, I love Dave Ramsey. But I found myself almost having those thoughts, like, you know, kind of pushing the metaphorical glasses up and be like, well, well actually, Judas, you know, well, actually, Mary, you know, you could have just taken a couple ounces out of the oil and then you could have invested the rest in one of those oil Roth IRAs. And then you could have gotten a 10% return over a course of decades. And then instead of a jar of oil, we could have poured out a barrel of oil. But I'm missing it because it wasn't a moment for practicality. It was a moment for passion. 
It wasn't what the moment called for. It was a moment for great sacrifice. So church, what great sacrifice is the Lord calling you to today? What's the oil that you have to pour out? You know, is it a one-off offering beyond your normal tithes? You know, is it the offering of time to disciple someone? Is it saying no to something so that you can say yes to more time in prayer? You know, what's the sacrifice that you have this week? And I've actually built it in to my time this morning. And so I'm actually gonna take a second and with no, no music, the room's totally dry. It's not an emotional moment. Just take a second. And I believe right now the Lord wants to download just a sacrifice for you, a practical hands-on sacrifice that you can make this week. And I want you to take a second on your phone or in your journal, just write it down. Just write it down. I'm just gonna give you a minute and just think. So Jesus, whatever that sacrifice is, just bring it to the front of our minds right now. Amen. now we're going to do what we do in youth ministry. And I want you at some point in this service, whether it's just your neighbor right now or your friend or your spouse that you're with, you can just tap on them and say, hey, will you keep me accountable for this? That in the next seven days, I would be faithful to whatever sacrifice God's calling me to. And maybe during ministry time at the end, you can ask someone, hey, would you keep me accountable in this? Um, I want us to be a, a merry church, a first commandment church, a church that's always looking to lay down more of our lives at Jesus' feet. None of us get on our deathbed and uh, re regret giving it all to Jesus. None of us are like, oh, we gave too much away. Oh, we prayed too much. We spent too much time loving on Jesus. So, laid down lovers always look foolish to the cold hearted. And the second bit, if you're taking notes today, is that Judas is a crusty criticizer, but Mary is a fresh follower. Judas is a crusty criticizer, but Mary is a fresh follower. You see, how many of you, if you really want to be honest, you can raise your hand, but you don't have to. You ever walk into church, the band starts playing a certain song, and you're like, oh, this one again? You're like, I just, I, I, I just heard this on the radio. Like I, and we're in this like hyper accessible era. So it's like, I just heard this on Spotify. I just heard this on Apple Music. Church, I just want you to know that you may get tired of singing the same song over and over, but Jesus never gets tired of hearing it. He loves your voice. He loves your voice. And there's biblical precedent for this, guys. Uh, we know in Revelation 4, 8, it says, the four living creatures each of them with six wings are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is to come. So we've got this group of angels who they get one song and they're not tired of it. They get one song and they're not tired of it. So my friend, even if you're a prenatal church attendee, there's fresh grace for you to love Jesus today. There's fresh grace. And I don't know about you, but we, on a side note, we're living in the golden era of worship music because we've got so many churches and teams putting out new music all the time. But it, you know, if you've been in the church or following Jesus for a while, like I have, it felt like there was kind of a run there from like, you know, uh, 95 to like 2005, when every single Sunday we always had, you came from heaven to earth to show the way. Yeah, my debt to pay. Amen. It's a good song. We need to bring that back. No, but seriously, you just, you can feel just the, just Judas, he just feels like he knows better. He's just crusty, you know? And you can just feel the freshness on Mary. Just, I, just, I just love Jesus. I love him so much, I might even make a dumb decision and just pour this oil out, you know? And when we hear that name, Judas, even saying it out loud, it kind of feels like a church cuss word, you know? 
we, we, we say that name and it, it, immediately you go, oh, that's the bad disciple. That's the bad one. So we do this and then we immediately disassociate. We go, well, that's, oh, that's not like me. I'm not a bad disciple. I can't relate. That was just the bad disciple that Jesus set up in his sovereignty so that he could go to the cross and be sold out to the Roman cross, you know. But that's nothing like me. I'm an American. We're always the good guys, right? Well, church, I just want to say, as I've been diving into this text, I've been convicted. Like I said earlier, with the money part, I just, you might be a lot more like Judas than you think. Like, can we just, can you give me just a little, a little grace and can we just go there for a second and just admit that we might be a lot more like Judas than we think sometimes. And, you know, bad guys, they don't think that they're the bad guys, you know? Most of us never think that we're the bad one, except for maybe a brief kind of fleeting moment of honesty. But we don't assume that we're Judas. But here's the thing. Judas is walking physically walking with Jesus for years and he still doesn't love him. He still doesn't serve him. His master is not Jesus. You see, information, information and experience don't equal life change. See, we have to be intellectually honest here. If a man was physically called out by God, called out by Jesus. Because there was a moment, it was Judas, come and follow me. So he gets his name physically called out. And then Judas physically walks with him for three years, sees him perform miracles, sees him change lives, yet doesn't walk away changed. If that can happen, then the same can be true for us. We can get in spiritual environments for years and not actually be changed. See, we can get in Bible studies and small groups and home groups and cell groups, in retreats and worship experiences and worship nights, all amazing things, all a part of his kingdom, all mandated by God and not actually walk away changed. You see, time doesn't equal heart change. Intention, submission, and ultimately God's sovereign hand, that's what changes hearts. You see, Mary had the intention, I'm gonna get it, Jesus, feed at all costs. I'm gonna pour the oil out. She had the submission, I'm submitted to you. Uh, she knew the biblical stewardship principle that this isn't even my perfume. It all, it's all came from God, it's all his. I'm going to give back to God what's his. She understood that. And ultimately she had God's sovereign hand of love. You know, I, uh, right after high school, I worked at this church in North Carolina and they had these, um, these auditorium seats. They had these auditorium seats uh, in the office. So the same seats that they used in the sanctuary they had these seats um, bolted to the ground in the office in the main hallway that you always, you always had to walk by. And it had a little placard there that said, the front row effect, the front row effect. It had a little paragraph describing it. And, and the paragraph described how often if you're at, you know, in a worship, you know, environment or especially like a movie theater or maybe a concert or something, that sometimes the front row even though you're physically the closest, isn't actually the best seat because you're kind of so focused in. You know, at the movies, you can't actually see the whole screen, you know? You kind of get isolated. Or if you're at a concert, sometimes the speakers are kind of over your head, so it doesn't actually sound the best. And their point was that you're working for this church, you're seeing a move of God firsthand every day. Don't take you for granted. Don't get used to it. Get the bigger perspective, get the bigger picture. And this is what Mary had. Mary's like, I'm all in with Jesus. And Judas didn't have this. Judas had become numb to spiritual environments. He had become numb to the movement of God, to the miracles of God. And church, I don't want that for us. I don't want that for us. So can we just do a little heart hygiene, a little oil check? 
This is something I like to do every few months is I'll just ask myself some of these questions. Just take some time and write them down, you know, in my journal and, and, and just reflect on them. And this is not exhaustive, but it's a good place to start. I'll ask myself, who have I become in the last few months? Am I more or less enthralled by relationship with Jesus? How's my prayer life? Do I humbly listen and boldly ask in prayer? Am I seeing answered prayers? How are my core relationships? What would people say about my attitude, my heart? You know, what's it like to do life with me? Do I hate slash kill my sin more than I did 12 months ago? Do I delight in God's word more than I did 12 months ago? See, I'll ask myself these things regularly. And it's not even about trying to quantify it. Although, I, you know, that can be important. I, I do want to be able to look at my life and go, yeah, there's less sin as I'm getting older. God's doing the work. He's sanctifying me. But we can't do any of these in our own strength. I think these are important. I think they're crucial to ask. I think, it's, you know, like scripture says, it's over, it says over 500 times in the Bible, go back, remember, look back. That's what these questions are. Reflect on what God's doing in your life and in your heart. But I want you to know that God's the one doing the work. And the only way you can actually see progress in any of these questions in your life is by being like Mary, by getting back at his feet, getting back at the feet of Jesus. So spend some time with him. Ask God these questions because these questions, they will show you what's overflowing in your hearts because humans, we're like plastic water bottles. Whatever's in a plastic water bottle, you squeeze it hard enough, it's coming out. You shake up the two liter, it's coming out. And so as our last point today, you need to know this, what fills your heart will overflow. Whatever fills your heart is gonna overflow. So does Jesus have your heart? Does Jesus have your heart? You see, I'm not asking, are you a Christian? I'm not asking, are you saved? You see, A.W. Tozer says that we shouldn't ask people, are you a Christian? We should ask people, does Christ dwell in you? Because that's a different question. That's a question of action. That's a question of, is, is the living spirit of God alive in you? So that sanctifying you by the work of the cross so you can die to yourself and rise to him daily. See, it's asking, does Jesus transform your worldview? I think this is on the next slide. Has Jesus transformed your worldview? your daily thought patterns, your money habits, and what you're excited to talk about. Because we see in that text there that all these people are coming to know Jesus because of Lazarus. Because his life had been changed. He had something to talk about. And when you get excited about something, you just can't help but talking about it. Have you talked to a vegan? Have you talked to a CrossFitter? They want to talk about it. Have you talked to, uh, you know, a, a Razorback fan in the heat of football season? And we're doing, you know, we're doing good. Like, they want to talk about it. It's really simple. But when Jesus does something in your life, you should want to talk about it. And that's where Lazarus was at. That's where he was at. See, Jesus had transformed his worldview had transformed what he wanted to talk about, what he wanted to think about. And he was excited to talk about Jesus. And so church, I, I just want you to hear me. I want you to hear me that the application for this message is not just feel really guilty for an afternoon, go to lunch, and then try to just do more Jesus stuff. No, 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 the application is that God's mighty hand of grace and his smiling face are reaching out to you right now, lovingly going, where's, where's the crusty parts? You know, you used to be so excited about me and I, I, I know you still love me, but where's the passion? Where's the zeal? You know, so, so I get to, you know, be a part of these camps and these weekend retreats with youth ministry and 
you know, you, you have these events and you watch just hundreds of teenagers just passionately love Jesus afterwards. And all of my life is just trying to get back to that place. Even as I get older, I just want to keep the heart of like sixth grade, you know, church summer camp alive in my heart again, you know? I want to keep that zeal for Jesus. Because I think something happens as we get older and we actually know more in our faith. We know more. We can break down the text for you. We can break down the Greek and the Hebrew and all that. But it's almost like there's this unwritten rule that the more we know about Jesus, the more serious we have to be. Because we know too much. And the problem is I don't see that in Scripture. I don't have a slide for this, but theology is for doxology. Knowing more about God is so that we can worship God more, so that we can love Him more, so we can love Him rightly, so we can keep that zeal alive, like it says in Romans 12, sustaining youthful zeal. And so right now, I just believe that the loving hand of God is reaching into your mind and letting you know, hey, here's some areas where You've gotten a little crust. Let's, let's just shake it off. I think this is important, especially as we go into new seasons, as, as we go into, you know, the summer and maybe there's some, some crustiness from just the busyness of life and sports and school and practice and all that. And, and it might be really simple. I know for me, as I've gotten older, I've just loved learning. I'm just, I'll become this podcast junkie, you know? And it's all good stuff. But sometimes I'm like, man, I miss, I kind of miss my 2005 Honda Civic Hybrid that I had in high school. And there was no aux, there was no Bluetooth. So all I had was three worship CDs that I would just destroy until they were all scratched up. And I would just love Jesus in my car every day on the way to high school. Now I know for me, I'm like, I, I gotta get back to that place, that place of Mary, where I just, I just love him. I'm just enthralled by him. So I wanna pray this prayer over us. I want to pray this prayer over us. And before I do, I'll just, I'll just read our points of the day. Is that laid down lovers look foolish to the cold hearted. Judas was a crusty criticizer, but Mary was a fresh follower. Who are you? And what fills your heart will overflow. So does Jesus have your heart? Church, would you just, if you're comfortable with it, just stick your hands out in a posture to receive. Now I'm going to pray this, this prayer over us. And you can look at the prayer you want, or you can close your eyes, and we'll have some music in the background. But here's a prayer to shake off the crustiness and just get in proper relationship with Him again. Father God, will you prepare my heart? Search me and know me. Reveal my anxieties and worries that I haven't given you and lead me back to you. Reveal any distance in my life that keeps me from loving you passionately. Cleanse my mind and my heart and help me to love you with all of my senses. Thank you for loving me first. Help me to love you cognitively and emotionally, in spirit and in truth. Renew a steadfast spirit within me and draw me close to you. Show me how to joyfully pour out my life to you. And thank you for your constant grace that pulls us into right relationship with you. Amen. Amen. There's a fresh grace this morning to love him like you did when you first got saved. There's a day one energy in the room this morning. <clears throat> and we're going to see a living example of that, of just pouring the oil of our lives out to him. And we have two baptisms this morning. So I'm going to pass this off to Brad. Great. Thank you, Noah.